Hi, it's Robin. Today we're going to be taking a look at the very first game I ever worked on. It was published here on Lodestar Disc Magazine, issue 161. That's my game Frogs and Flies between Julia Sets and Parapsychologist. This is a monthly disc magazine that published Commodore 64 software every month, and they kept going into the 2000s, amazingly. This particular issue, 161, was from 1997. This was the three and a half inch edition, but they also published on classic five and a quarter inch discs. Here's the publication agreement that I signed with them for a total of $250 paid. And we signed that agreement. I guess this was my copy, I never signed it, but I mailed one back to them. And it was from October 23rd, 97 that we signed that. And here's the pay stub where I got $300. That was $250 for Frogs and Flies and $50 for writing for Lodestar Letter, issue 50. I think I've shown that in previous episodes. This was a dream come true for me. That in 1997, I finally got paid, even just a little bit of money, to make a video game, especially for my beloved Commodore 64. This was the first commercial, so to speak, a game I ever got to work on. And really, it helped start my career in video game development uh, very directly, actually. But that's, I guess, a story for another time. So I've got Turbo Macro Pro started up here. I'm running the earlier version 1.03 that I used to write this game. I did all the development on my Commodore 64 in 1997. And I'm just realizing that is half my life ago. I am now almost almost exactly twice as old as I was back then. Wow. So I've got Turbo Macro Pro started up here, and I've already loaded the source and the data files into Turbo Macro Pro, and we'll just try the game out a bit so you have an idea what I'm talking about today. But we're going to take a look at the source code for this. This actually takes almost 40 seconds to assemble and a lot of it is because my code was so inefficient, and we'll look at that later on. <laughs> so yeah, I'll for fast forward this. All right, you see it's assembled all the way from 8,000 hex all the way up to CB06, and that's the binary. And there's a bunch of data files that are loaded lower in memory from about 1,000 up to 8,000. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. Press S to start. <laughs> and here we go. Here's the title screen, Frogs and Flies 64 by Pseudo Softworks PSW, which is a name I just used a lot back then. Uh, that became my demo group, that became my music label. <laughs> Anything creative I did, I did under that PSW. So these credits, Robin Harbron, I see I gave myself credits. Actually, it's true. Code, music, sound effects, the font, and the background graphics. And my good friend Darren Folds, and you probably saw that episode I did with him about his Space Invaders type game, Invader. Anyway, he did the cute frog sprites for this game. And that's what's here on the tile screen is a very blown up version of that frog. Down at the bottom, copyright 1997 Lodestar. I should actually mention that agreement I signed with them. It's actually pretty fair. Down here... I agree not to sell this version of this product or any version that closely resembles it without the written permission of JNF Publishing. I retain the right to use the algorithms, routines, and data contained in the code of the product in other programs. And I also agreed that if a bug was discovered in the product, that I would help uh, fix it. But anyway, I thought that was very fair, where basically I can't go selling this, this exact same game to another company, but I'm free to use it. I'd even be free to build upon it for a sequel and so on. Anyway, I thought it was a very fair agreement. And about the $250, you can imagine what the retail C64 market was like in 97. I was surprised it even existed. Never mind that a company could pay $250 for a little game. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if that music's driving you crazy, but this remains the only game that I did the the music for, the sound effects for, and art for. Moving left or right on the joystick changes the difficulty level between beginner and advanced. 
and I'll show what that means later. This is a two-player game, but it also has an AI that I wrote, so actually it can be played single-player as well. Oh, and I should say that this was originally an Atari 2600 game, Frogs and Flies, and also an Intellivision game called Frogbog, I believe, and I shamelessly ripped it off. My friend Doug had given me his Atari 2600 in 97 or so and told me this was a great game. I didn't know about it. And actually, my wife would actually play it with me. So I thought, ah, oh, I should try porting this. Oh, and there's a whole other story. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to go on and on. And the way I finally found time to write this game, I had just started a job, which was actually my career for about 12 years after that. And it was unionized. And we went on strike right after I started the full-time job. So I was compelled to go on strike, even though I was perfectly happy with the terms of my employment, given that it was like the first couple months of my job. <laughs> so anyway, we had three weeks, uh, at least three weeks of strike. So that's what I did during this time. I wrote this game at home when I wasn't on the picket line and kind of fulfilled a dream. So it worked out for the best. Oh, and you notice that says hit Q to quit. And Lodestar asked me to add that in because Lodestar has a policy that all their programs should always return to the main disk menu, that all programs would do that. Most Commerce 64 games or demos do not clean up after themselves and clean the exits. Actually, that was quite a bit of work after. We'll probably see that in a while. So that was their request. Okay, here we go, finally. So I am the green frog on the left. And the way the controls work is if you push left or right, he'll jump in that direction. And the longer you hold the joystick, the longer he jumps. And if you push, if you pull down, he'll do a very low kind of jump. And if you push up, he'll do a very high arc. So there's actually a lot of control between the fact that you can hold the joystick longer to put more power into it. So this was very challenging for me at first because of the, the physics involved. All right, now I'm already behind three, nothing. The green score at the top, it's color coded. Oh, well there, and if you miss the, miss the lily pad, you splash in. So it's a little bit like a platform game. Those black flies are worth one point each. And you press the button to stick out your tongue. Now those white flies were another addition that Lodestar asked me to make. They felt that it needed another element. So those, oops. I'm <laughs> not doing very good. I should be able to win. Um, the white flies actually give you negative points. And that was something that wasn't really in the original game. That AI is just beating me here. Of course, when you write the AI yourself, either way you win, right? I got two at once. So even though it's a very simple game, all these different elements all kind of added up in the complexity. And there's a time limit to each game. See how this, this background's getting darker. So when it turns to nighttime, then the game is really over. Was nice one, two and one. There we go. 26 to 22, the end. 
And um, yeah, that annoying music actually uses digi drums, digital drums. And I only kind of remember, I think there's a program called Digi Organizer. So I composed the main song in something called JCH, I think, and then added the Digi Drums using another program after. Uh, that would be its whole own episode trying to explore that and, and me remembering how I managed that. <laughs> oh, and the song itself is like a kitty folk song. Like, five green and speckled frogs sat on a speckled log. One that I knew either from camp or from kids or, uh, I don't know. I don't even remember. Pretty happy with that bass line. That's my main instrument, bass. Okay, finally. So if we hit Q to quit, brings us back to basic. <laughs> it prints a Q on the screen. All right, and then sys384 will re-invoke. That's the jump back for Turbo Macro Pro. There we are. So that's a tour of the game. We'll take a look at the code. Now, this code is so inefficient. I'm, I'm not showing you this code to brag and not really even as like, don't do as I do. <laughs> but I think it still might be informative. As I've said before, bad code is okay, especially when you're doing things like game or hobby programming. I mean, good code is good. Bad code is bad. But to me, the important thing is actually getting something done, realizing your vision, uh, especially when it's something like games where like there aren't lives at stake. I mean, if, if you're writing terrible code that's going to crash, you know, medical equipment or whatever, of course, good code is important. But when you're making a game, when you are just realizing a dream, whatever it takes. Now, of course, your bad code might prevent you from getting there, but if you can push through and get the thing done, ship it, and then you learn, you'll just, you will get better. So if, if you press F8, it jumps right to the bottom of the source code. It's an incredible, that L right below the cursor there, 3,149 lines. What an embarrassment. So this, I'm, Absolutely positive I could rewrite this in half the lines, maybe even under a thousand lines. I don't know. We'll look at some of it, but some, some of the code is horrible. Okay, let's get on with it. So the reason I'm starting the code here, this is the origin at 8,000. I believe that's because that bitmap screen, oh yeah, that background, I painted that. <laughs> I'm a terrible artist. So I think I made that in koala paint. Anyway, that needed to be down in the bottom of memory, uh, be below. When you're making a bigger game, you need to figure out where all your different, nowadays we call them assets, you know, your graphics, your music, and so on go. Because I was cobbling this together in such a disorganized way, it's kind of all spread all over. But, of course, always use labels. This is screen memory, 5400. And this play one SC is the location where you can choose the skill level on the title screen. That's what this means right here, where it says beginner or advanced. This is where that gets printed out on the screen memory. And this is for player two. And I had to remember that this is for the title screen. Screen memory is at location 3000. And this is the color memory. It gets copied. Later we'll see that. And the BM, this is the bitmap screen memory and the bitmap color. So this is where they are stashed and then they are copied into screen memory later. We'll look at that. Bad fly, that's just a flag when I had to add that white fly. That's the bad one. I add a flag in for that. SC1, this is the screen location of the score. And it's right at the top of the line. You know, you saw the score there. So the top of the screen, plus 10 and plus 25. This is the left score, player one and player two score. Some sprite pointers. That's at the end of screen memory. That's where the C64, just those last eight bytes. The font, that's that tile screen font I made. This is the video chip. That's my old habit from basic using v equals five three two four eight you notice how i use so many decimal values here that goes back that i started 
Uh, at this point, I'd probably been about 13 years of programming the Commodore 64 and started with BASIC. And this was a big level up, finishing a full game in assembly language. The address for joystick one and two are timeout. I believe that's 800 frames, 800. So that's about uh, 10, 12, thir about 13 seconds. If the player doesn't move the joystick, then the AI takes over after that timeout has counted down. It's kind of a neat idea not having to choose the computer AI. And that I stole right from the Atari 2600 version. That's how it does it too. Neat control scheme. And game time, this is how long a game lasts. I have no idea why I did this one in hacks. But anyway, that's, that's the number of frames that a game lasts. And a few more addresses here. The sound effect routine is at 1,000. The actual music is at 2,000. And the digi data is at 9,000. Oh yeah, and the code that starts at 8,000, it actually does a big section from eight to 9,000, it's a 4K block, and then it jumps ahead to C1000 after all the digis, uh, which are all the samples that are in memory. And different speeds, low, medium, and high, which I think are used both for the frog movement and for the fly movement. And random, this is a weird address to use, but that is the CIA timer, counting down over and over again. I actually use that as a random seed. Kind of weird, but again, I'm not saying this is good, but it does work. So here's just some cleanup. This just clears any CIA interrupts, then disables them. And this is a bit of code that got added when Lodestar asked for that Q quit function. I did this backup of all the vector table. This is a kernel call. You tell it where you want to back up the vector table to and this is all the ones that BASIC uses for normal operation. So I, I stash those all at CF100 here. And here's the beginning of the title screen routine. Again, killing the interrupts, lots of duplicate code here. That kills all interrupt sources. And that's some VIC initialization. Blanking the screen, I don't even know why I did that, if it was necessary. But this is where we use the CIA to point the VIC chip to the second block of memory from 4000 to 7FFF hex. By default, the VIC, the VIC can only see 16K at a time, and normally that's the first 16K. We're moving it to the second block. That bit of code, that's all in the programmer's reference guide. And also saying the video pointers so that the screen memory is at 5400 and the font it is using, or the character set, is at 5800. That jumps off to do the title screen routine. So we'll look at that in a bit. But then when it exits from the title screen, then the game is starting. So it sets up frog one, fly one, frog two, fly two. And this is, there's all kinds of inefficient code here, but this is the worst. I actually did not know how to get one routine to operate both frogs, like with an index where you say, okay, frog zero or frog one, if we call them that. I just could not get my head around some of the, some of the indexing to make that possible. I know I knew about indexing at this time, but I think once I had written the complete frog routine, I hadn't thought fully about how am I going to make the second frog. So unbelievably, I duplicated all that code and then just modified it so it would work for the second frog. So this is a super, <laughs> do not do this, but this is how I did it. We'll see a bit more of that later. I also don't know why I frequently use these double nibbles for background color, but I do it throughout I must have had some misunderstanding about that upper nibble for color registers, which are just basically unused and even disconnected. But for whatever reason, I seem to be in the habit of, instead of just putting E in there, I'm putting EE. -E. It doesn't really matter, but it shows I didn't know what was going on. Okay, so we set up the background color. 
This is an initialization into the sound effect routine, which I did not write. It was just an existing, we could call it a library, an existing binary. You see my episode about doing music, about playing back music. I explain all that. Okay, and this game timer. This is just a counter I have. It's not really like a CIA. It's not a hardware timer. It's just my own routine and every frame I decrement. You can do so much with games just by having a counter that counts up or down and you check for it every frame. Very common pattern. Here we just set the score to zero. I don't know why I shrink the borders, but I do. Okay, and then this turns on bitmap mode to show that lovely pond that I drew. And now this big ugly thing is copying the saved screen memory into the place it needs to be for the Vic to display it. When you want to update the whole screen, like between the title screen and the in-game bitmap, you have two choices. Either you put it in the right place and then you point the Vic to it, or you can copy it from somewhere else to where the Vic expects to see it. I'm doing the latter. I'm moving it to where the Vic is expecting it to be. Not entirely sure why I did that, but I did. There might be a reason for it, or it might just be my inexperience. Okay, and this just clears that top area of the screen where the score is going to get updated. And this is a whole bunch of code to me. Well, it's not that much, but this sets the left hand score to green and the right hand to purple. And then a setup sprites routine that we'll get to later. I don't know why I thought this was dangerous. Kill NMIs. I think that was necessary because the Digi routine uses those NMIs. Okay. Oh yeah. And so we had blank the screen because we're doing this partial bitmap copy, not really the bitmap, but the color data for the bitmap. So maybe it just looked ugly. Maybe it looked better. Turn the screen off, copy everything, turn the screen on rather than showing it all appear as it probably took a few frames to do that copy. And then here we're going to start up the interrupt routine. We're pointing it to IRQ1. I have a bad habit of all these IRQs. I just call them IRQ1, IRQ2, instead of giving a more descriptive name about what part of the screen it draws or, or handles. Okay, but it apparently fires at raster line 100. Now, the reason for that is because the top part of the screen is text to easily show the score, but the bottom part of the screen is the pond, the bitmap with the lily pads and the trees and so on. Basically, every frame we're switching from character mode to bitmap mode just for convenience, so we don't have to figure out how to plot the score onto a bitmap. And then here, the game actually just processes this section over and over again, looking for a variable called done yet. And until it is set to two, we're just going to keep doing this loop. So that is actually all the game does from then on in the main task, so to speak. Once done yet is set to two, then it's reset back to zero and we jump back to the title screen. So there, we are now through the whole main game loop. That's it. And we're only on line 213. Oh, about 2,900 lines to go, <laughs> which is all the rest of the game, which is all IRQ driven, all interrupt driven. So now we've got a whole bunch of variables just right here in memory. That done yet flag, whatever player one and two are doing, that's their state. We'll see that in a bit. Game timer, that's that 16 bit counter that we use to process time. The background color is as the sky darkens, it's stored there. Bot, which I think is short for button. <laughs> I probably just thought it was funny. Forever 12. And G timer, the game timer, and a temporary variable. Here we are in the main game loop. IRQ1, push everything on the stack, which is really actually unnecessary. That code uh, up above is, is a lot simpler, but anyway, just being safe. Here's that strange trick where we acknowledge the raster interrupt just by incrementing it. 
very common demo scene thing, even if we don't understand why that works. Really, you should just be writing a value into it, like value one. And this is where we're switching over to bitmap mode and saying the next interrupt and saying the next interrupt for roster line 58, which is way back up the screen again. Actually, it seems I set the very first interrupt to roster line 100, but from then on, I'm set to 58 because that's right under the score. I guess just I didn't know how to get the interrupt started the very first time, but then from then on, it uses these values and then sets the raster interrupt for IRQ3. Yeah, sets the border and background color to zero. Checks if we're done yet. If we're not zero, then the game must be over, but otherwise we're gonna do the main loop. And this is all the processing of the game. And this is, yeah, what, what we call the inner, the game loop. Pretty much every game has this central loop that calls all the different routines in order. So brain one is the artificial intelligence. <laughs> and then frog one actually does the work. So brain one sets the, if the AI is active, sets the joystick inputs. Otherwise the frog reads the joystick for itself. We'll get to that later. So again, we got this horrible split where I've got the AI for frog one and then the actual frog one movement. Frog 2 AI in movement, Fly 1 and Fly 2 individually, <laughs> terrible. Update the score, update the sound effects, update the timer, and then jump ahead to done. Now, if we hit the end game, then this is the end game loop where basically we are moving down that, so that game over sprite that comes down the screen. That's what we're doing here gradually. So this actually isn't just immediately the end of the game. It stays in the state while frame by frame that sprite moves down, but everything else keeps processing. So it just does one step of that sprite per frame until it reaches the right place. And then here it checks for this load a butt where it's checking the joystick. And first it's waiting for it to be pressed and then for it to be released. It's like a debounce routine. How horrible, eh? Look how it just goes on and on. That's, that's all that's doing. And it's also checking for both joysticks. So either player one or two can press the fire button. But this is a bit of polish that games could use. A, a very amateur game. If you're playing a game and you get game over... And you're, you know, you've know you been hitting the fire button or wiggling the joystick, trying to avoid losing your last life. But then you do get killed. A very amateur game, which I certainly have made a lot of in the past, you might just be hammering the fire button, you get game over, and now you're already at the title screen, and now you've already started a new game, and you haven't even realized that you got game over yet, because the button checking is so amateur. So adding a bit of a delay first and then waiting for a button to be maybe both pushed and released is all a little bit of polish that goes a long way. Okay, and now here we are waiting for, yeah, and I think I've shown you this bad habit of mine too, where I call a busy loop waiting for a certain raster line, an IRQ, I give it a label of an IRQ, even though it has nothing to do with the interrupt but it's just waiting for a certain raster line to occur. Okay, set the screen back for the score line. So this is at the end of the bitmap. We then set it back to character mode. Check if we're done. And otherwise, here we exit. Exit the interrupt and go back to IRQ1 and get ready to process that interrupt near the top of the screen again. Or if we were shutting down, then we turn off the sound, turn off the interrupts, and then return. I don't know why I didn't just branch back up here, but anyway. Okay, moving on. Now here's the routine for the first fly. And I've stuck all the variables for the fly here in main memory. I don't know why I didn't use zero page. It seems like I didn't use zero page at all in this. Yeah, actually. You know I might not have even used indirect indexing a single time for this entire game. I'm not positive about that, but I sure, sure looks like it so far. 
So of course, zero page is faster. It uses less memory for instructions. Um, but this fly is actually kind of complicated. I have 16 bit values for the fly X and Y position. And even for the acceleration in the X and Y, which doesn't seem completely necessary, but anyway, uh, that's what I did. And then the action that the fly is doing, and then a timer, which I believe is how long until the fly chooses a new action and the fly animation. That's like the frame number and the timer for the fly animation. So you see those simple little flies actually have a lot that goes into them. And this is probably all necessary. Like maybe not, I probably didn't need 16 bit acceleration values, but, but for the sprite, but certainly the 16 bit positions are necessary because the fly has fractional uh, speed to it or fractional positioning. So this was getting pretty advanced for me and I don't think I did it perfectly, but it was a step in the right direction. So we'll look through this fly and then maybe that'll be it for today. And I'll record another section where I go through the rest of the code. So I use this block so that I can have my own, uh, so I can reuse my terrible local labels like next to. So we decide here, what is the fly action? And if it's equal to zero, that means this is a new fly that's just being spawned, so to speak. Really, these fly actions, I should have had a defined table where new fly equals zero. And then down here, I set fly action to one. And then instead of just putting a one in there, I should be using like a define, like zero is new fly and one is spawning or, or whatever. It'd make the code a lot more readable and maintainable. And we're saying the animation to zero and the timer to 10 frames. And now we're turning on that flies sprite. Oh, in this game, we have two sprites dedicated, one to each fly. And then each frog gets three sprites. One for the multicolor image, one for the black outline to make it look sharper. And then one for the tongue of each. So that's all eight sprites used. I don't know what small fly is. Do I have big fly sprites too? I don't, don't remember. So here we're loading in that random value, which is really just a CIA timer that keeps moving. And I guess I could have used the SID, although I'm not sure about the sound effect routine. That wasn't necessarily an option because I was using a package not only for the title screen music and digis, but also a sound effect package, which I don't remember the name of, which was constantly driving the sound effects for more advanced sound effects. So they weren't just fire and forget sound effects, but they're dynamically processed. And so maybe I couldn't use the SID for the random number generator. And maybe I didn't understand uh, linear feedback shift registers at that time. I don't think I knew about them. Okay, so we load the random number and we shift it to multiply it by two. This is what creates those white bad flies. When we're spawning the new fly, one in four or one in eight flies will be those white ones and therefore bad. And so we just store that in its, the sprite color register. Otherwise it's a regular black fly. And again, we grab random, but we rotate it. And this is where we decide is we get another random number. And if the low bit is zero, then we're going to start like on the left side and otherwise we're going to start on the right side. So it's just choosing where to spawn it. And this is some weird positioning here. 16 times 16, 256. And then we get yet another random number. Now random's probably going to be the same I, I don't know if I have random set to change every single cycle or not, but presumably the random number is changing quickly enough. And even if it isn't, we're kind of taking different slices of that same random number each time. Okay. And then we do some funny math here. Oh yeah. This is to set the Y value. Okay, I have a range of 63 valid pixels. 
and then add 120 and then some kind of goofy math here. And then we're going to set the initial acceleration. So yeah, this whole thing here is start L that's for start left. And then here is start right. We're either spawning the fly on the left side or the right side. Oh yeah. And the reason I see here, we're either spawning at pixel 16 and because of the fractional math, we're multiplying that by 16 because there are four sub bits. That is each pixel is split into 16 fractional pixels that the Vic can actually display, but internally we're using it to allow for different speeds of movement rather than only be able to move in whole integer speeds. Okay. And so here's the right hand side, 342 is the X position off the right hand side of the screen or right, right near it. Okay. So that's just basically a duplicate of the code that could certainly be cleaned up somewhat just using a table and, uh, anyway. Okay. And then you go here, we've got a timer that we decrement. And when the timer counts down, then we're going to get a new direction, load a with random. And then the fly is going to choose what direction to go just based on a random number. I do some fiddly math here and then choose the new X acceleration. And here is the new Y acceleration for the fly. And I just play around with these numbers a lot to come up with the best, you know, just whatever had kind of the most interesting pattern. I'm pretty happy with how the flies move around. They'll just stop for a while, then they'll get going again. And uh, overall, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how they moved around. So that's all it is. Each, each movement, the fly decides what direction to move for a while and for how long it'll do that. And that reconsiders. And here we're doing the actual movement where we're taking the existing fly X position, adding the acceleration, which could be anywhere from zero up to probably a couple pixels at a time. And this is just 16 bit math here. And here's the animation timer where it looks like every five or six frames, the, I toggle between the two different sprites, just the wings to make the wings flap. And here we check for the boundary of the fly. If the fly is going to fly off the screen, either left here or right or up or down then the fly will react to that. <laughs> so this is very convoluted. Oh yeah, so by doing this exclusive or, it's kind of like in Pong or something, your acceleration is going one way. If you're accelerating up, then if the fly hits the boundary, well, this is checking the downside, but whatever. Okay, we're just checking a Y position for going up or we're going down here. If the fly gets down the bottom of the screen, we just flip the Y acceleration around and then it becomes like a negative. If it was, well, I guess it's obvious that if the fly hits the bottom of the screen, then it needs to bounce up. So we are just flipping the Y acceleration the opposite way. Again, that's probably uglier than it needs to be. And then finally, we are going to display the fly, which really just means set the, the uh, sprite registers to match. So we're taking the, fl the fly's X position and then calling this little convert routine, which just converts the 16 bit value, which is I think really like a 12.4, 12 bits integer and four bits fractional fixed point and converts it just to a regular eight bit value. We'll get to that routine later. And then here, we're just storing that in the sprite X position and in the carry, oh, we have the ninth bit will be there. And we have to choose because of that pesky ninth bit for sprites that all C64 coders had to wrestle with originally where you set, is it the first 256 pixels or is it the right hand edge that we need to set? so on. And the Y is always a bit easier because it's just an 8-bit value instead of a 9-bit. 
Okay, and that's the end of the block. Okay, and let's just, we'll cover a little bit more here. Sprite collision, we're gonna call this routine. Push everything on the stack, just for safety's sake, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, f I forgot. <laughs> so I'm actually using the sprite collision interrupt. And, oh, it's bizarre that I'm using this, but the sprite collision built into the VIC, the VIC2 video chip, is not very good. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, but it'll tell you that two sprites touched each other, but it, it doesn't even do that, actually. It tells you that one spray is involved in a collision and another spray is involved in a collision, but not necessarily that they are together. There's a whole bunch of reasons that most games don't make use of the hardware register, but uh, I, I did. But in addition, I actually used the very rarely used interrupt for that sprite collision. Yes, by using the interrupt, you're told right away that an interrupt happened because that the VIC knows because it's as it's drawing those sprites to the screen, it detects the collision because it's put out a sprite pixel for the, both sprites at the same time. So I'm take, making use of that to actually check the collision register and see, was it the same two sprites at the same time? But on the other hand, uh, I should probably do an anal analysis on this, but it might be triggering all kinds of false, false interrupts too, like collisions that I don't care about. Wow. I actually did do a quick review of this before I started making this video, but I forgot that I had used that feature. So anyway, this is the whole routine that checks right after that interrupt happened, did those collisions happen? And try to determine, you know, this was it frog one to fly two? Was it frog one to fly one? Was it frog two to fly one? Oh, what ugly, ugly code. And if so, you know, we add the score to the correct one. And if there's no collision, we return. So that is a pretty huge collision routine there. Very inefficient, but somehow it works. Wow. And here's a routine that just adds the score. If you got, if you ate a black fly and here subtracts the score, if you ate a poison white fly, that was added for Lodestar. And again, the same routines. Adding the score, you know, instead of... The right way to do this is to have one routine where you tell it uh, the index of the player, either 0 or 1, and the amount of the score, positive or negative or whatever. And just the one routine services all those possibilities. But that's not how I did things in 97. <laughs> wrote each one individually. Okay, and here's the routine for the setup sprites. So the default is these are the sprites that are turned on. 3 plus 24. Each frog, as I was saying, is two sprites. So there's one of them. And then 24 is, uh, what, 8 and 16. So this is sprite 0 and 1. And this is sprite 3 and 4. And we're turning on those sprites. There's some old commented out code. And here we tell the outline of the sprite, of the two sprites to be black. And here one frog is green and one is purple. And the tongue sprites are red. And the flies default to black. That gets set when they spawn anyway, so it's not even really necessary. Yeah, and... Uh, I guess those are the default sprite pointers. Those are the two tongues there. Okay, and here is the code for the frog. And now here we're finally up to like line 800. So last time, one feature I neglected to explain fully before we get to the code. This will help with the explanation. If you see where it says joystick 1 and 2, I'm this is joystick 2 right now. If I move it left or right, it changes from advanced to beginner. 
And that's the control mode that you play the game in. In beginner mode, we'll start the game here. I'm the green frog. Every time you press the joystick in any direction, the frog automatically jumps over to the other lily pad. There's no skill involved in that. You push down, up, left, right, whatever. You'll always jump to the opposite lily pad. And so really, you're just timing when you jump, and then you press fire. So that's the easy beginner level. Now, this matters a bit because this is also what the AI uses when the AI is playing, there now, you see how the green frog is just jumping on its own now. There's a timeout, and once that's expired, then the computer takes over playing. And that's a, a kind of a neat thing that even the Atari 2600 version did, where rather than having to choose one or two player, just with that little timeout feature, it becomes a... What could be a two-player game becomes a one-player game or even a, a zero-player game, like where the computer takes over for both frogs. So it's a neat little thing, and all I was, I was just copying what the Atari did. And if you hit Q, it quits back to the title screen. And just to see that advanced mode, so I've just moved it over, and in advanced mode, if you pull down on the stick, he does a shallow jump. Oops. <laughs> if you push up, he does a high jump, but not as far, not as far horizontally. If you push left or right, then does kind of a medium height jump. And the longer, if you just tap shortly, I'm just going to tap left. See, those are tiny jumps. Hold a little bit longer. If you hold it to the maximum, there is a maximum distance. Pushing up there. Let's push up very briefly. Okay. So just to give you an idea of the two different control schemes. And we'll see that as we look at the source code. Okay, so I'm going to press the reset button. And there's that little jump back code in Turbo Macro Pro. This version is Sys384. Later versions use Sys320. Okay, and that brings us back into the assembler. Okay, this is where we left off last time. This block of bytes is all the storage, all the variables, so to speak, of the frog. So the frogs X and Y. Well, it's really interesting I have word zero zero rather than just a single word. Word has two consecutive bytes. It's like a 16-bit value. Well, maybe we'll see why that is. I suspect that's a mistake. And here's the X acceleration and the Y acceleration. And that's the wrong word. It should be velocity. I think I explained that last time. And that's the distance that the frog is going to move per frame. And this is in a strange 12.4 fixed point format where four bits are dedicated to sub-pixel. And that is fairly inefficient. I don't really know why I did it that way. Okay, and the rest of these action is like, what is the frog doing at this moment? You know, we'll look at some of these as we get to the code that actually uses them. The direction is just, I believe, one or zero for left or right, the frame for the frog, whether the tongue is stuck out, is the button being pushed, what level, that means is it beginner or advanced, or that actually keeps track of the AI mode as well. Timeout, that's a 16-bit value, just a counter, that's to keep track of the time until the AI takes over. And this is a little table that controls how high the frog jumps at a maximum. Okay, and so here's the code for frog one. And as I mentioned last time, this is super inefficient because I've written all the code for frog one. 
and then I copy and paste it and tweak it for frog two. And really, if I had understood indirect indexing, I should have used that. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, it would have shrunk the code by nearly half. So we load the joystick port two, and that's for frog one. And we're, I'm adding it with 31. That is the low five bits of the joystick port, four bits for the four directions, up, down, left, right, and one bit for the joystick. And then we check, is it equal to 31? That means that there's no movement at all. Joystick, and actually all input output on the C64 is normally high, and you bring it low by uh, you know closing a switch by moving the joystick. So it returns a one when it's inactive. Kind of the opposite of what you might expect. Then we're going to continue on. Okay, but if there was any movement, we disable the AI and we also reset the timeout counter. So every time you move a joystick or press the button, the timeout counter restarts. So that seems inefficient, but a lot of the time in assembly programming, C64 programming, it uses even more memory to choose not to do something. You know, maybe this isn't necessary all the time, but overall it uses less code to just repeatedly change a value. Okay. And then kind of amusingly, we decrement the timeout, even though we just reset it. And we're checking for the timer to run out. But that, will, that won't happen as long as you're moving the joystick, because this keeps getting reset higher. Again, this isn't necessarily bad code. And if the timer did run out, then we're going to set store 2 into the frog 1 level. So there's beginner, advanced, and then there's autoplay. Kind of weird that I'm using that same plague, but... And with autoplay starting, the frog actually snaps back to its starting position. So if you had played a bit, move the frog over, you know, to the right-hand half of the screen or well, anywhere, when autoplay starts for player one, the frog will snap back to the left position. It's kind of ugly, but... But games do this sort of thing all the time, where it's not really realistic that a frog will just teleport. But that is game logic. <laughs> you do it because otherwise we're going to do a whole bunch of code to try and make the frog automatically move back to that starting position and then to start to jump. And as I said, the AI is just using that beginner mode where it just jumps between two spots back and forth and it forces the frog to face to the right. That's zero means to the right, and one, I believe, means to the left. Then we're going to check the action, and this is like a state. This keeps track of the state of the frog, and pretty horribly I just use numbers for this, but really, if this is like C, well, even in an assembly language, where instead of just using magic numbers like zero, one, two, three, to mean idle, jumping, swimming. Instead, it's best to define them and say idle equals zero, swimming equals one, and so on. But that's not how I did it. So if zero, then we are still, meaning sitting still, <laughs> And otherwise, we'll jump ahead to not still if the frog is in the midst of making a move. So if the frog is still, then we check if we are in autoplay mode. We check the current level. If it's zero, then we're going to branch ahead to seven. Okay, so zero is advanced. One is beginner. I guess it's alphabetical order. So here, now we're in beginner mode. And now we check. Are we in autoplay mode? If so, do the B jump. And otherwise, we're going to check the joystick and make sure there's no joystick movement. 
And then here we are, we're actually going to do a jump. And notice that we, we don't actually move the frog here. We're not touching the frogs X or Y. Instead, we're putting the frog into motion. And how do we do that? We have a variable that keeps track of time and one that keeps track of, it's kind of goofy. I don't know why I'm using all three action type and level, but basically we're setting variables and it's like, it's kind of like an engine or a machine where you instruct the machines what to do. And then they carry out that action kind of independently. Now, of course there's code to make the frogs move, but that's not what we're doing here. We're just triggering the jump. And here we're saying some sound effects. That's the jump sound effect. And because this is the beginner mode, what we do is check. We load up frog one's X position, the low and high bytes, and we call this convert routine. And this very inefficiently, <laughs> while the code itself isn't that inefficient, but calling it so often and it shifts it by four bits as, as CS Bruce pointed out, this is kind of maximizing the amount of conversion work that has to be done because we're using one nibble as the fraction. So you have to shift four bits one way or the other. They're maximally inefficient. So this converts that 12.4 bit value into a 8-bit value, actually a 9-bit value, with carry set. So all we're doing is checking, is the frog on the left side of the screen or the right screen? If it's on the left side of the screen, we force the frog to face right, and then we tell it it's going to accelerate at the medium jump pace here, and then we're going to go ahead and continue. But otherwise we're going to jump left. So we tell the frog to face left. And then I guess, cause I didn't know what I was doing. This is making it so the X acceleration is a negative value to the left. And then we continue unnecessary jump here. And whether you're jumping left or right, we've set the X acceleration, but here we're going to set the Y acceleration. So that's making him jump up and then we go ahead to the move. So that takes care of the beginner and AI jump. Now we're here in the advanced jump and we're going to check the joystick. And did the player press up? If so, then this is the highest jump. So we go through and set the X acceleration and based on the direction we branch here and set the X acceleration either to the right or to the left. And either way, we set the Y acceleration upwards because this is the highest jump. So we set the Y acceleration to a fairly large value. Trigger the sound effect. Okay, and here, if the player is pushing right on the joystick, then again, we set up the jump and we don't actually have to check the direction. If it's left or right, we force the frog direction in the appropriate direction and then set the acceleration and the Y acceleration. And here's the left jump, same idea. And if you pull down, that's the shallowest jump. And again, same the various variables, checking if it's left or right, and we're done. And we jump ahead to move, so we'll get there in a bit. Now, quite a ways back, we branched or we jumped ahead if it was not still. So this means that there's already a move in progress. If we were still, then you check for joystick to trigger an action. While the frog is either in flight or swimming, you don't have direct control over the frog anymore, uh, except for the button for the tongue, but we'll get to that later. Here we're checking if the frog's action is three. So we check three, and this means that a splash is underway. There's a little splash animation when you fall into the water. So if so, make sure that the frog spray is actually disabled while that splash is playing. 
And then we've got a timer that's decrementing. And that keeps track of as the splash animation plays, we just kind of have to freeze, stay in this state while that animation plays. So that's why we're keeping track of the timer. And then we update the splash frame animation. And if it's complete, then we jump ahead and trigger swimming mode. So he'll swim, swim back to the lily pad. But if not, we just jump ahead to move. Okay. And so here we're going to turn the frog sprite back on, check which way is he swimming and set his speed based on the, his swimming speed and go ahead to move. Okay, or if he's swimming the other direction, this is where we set it. So this is kind of like a state machine. And I don't think I even understood state machines really back then. I kind of invented it out of necessity. Well, of course, I didn't invent it. I mean, I reinvented it, sort of. <laughs> but definitely look up. If you don't know about state machines, and very useful in video games, it's a very simple concept. Really, you know, when he's idle, then it'll listen to joystick responses, but then you go into like a jump mode, into a swimming mode, and you just keep track of it with a variable and usually a timer in the case of games. Okay, so that's swimming both directions, or sorry, this triggers the swimming. And then once you actually are swimming, then here's where we check the swim position. And I do some really nasty math here to check if he's gotten back, I say to land, but if he gets back to his lily pad, <laughs> so just hard coded values here. I don't know why I was, there was probably some frustration here, but anyway, checking if he's back to the left or right of the left lily pad, the left or right of the right lily pad. So here's just these four hard code positions and checking that he's actually back on land, so to speak. <laughs> okay, and finally, done. Jump to move. Well, okay, if we did get to land, so this is jumping ahead to that move that we keep talking about, to land, and this is where we reset the frog. He's back to idle. The X acceleration is reset, and we reset the frog that looks like fly, isn't it, doesn't it? But that's frog one Y. So basically the frog gets reset back up on the lily pad, ready to jump again. Okay, if the frog was not still, we've handled the idle case, we've handled the swimming, the splashing. So now we're looking, is the frog jumping with uh, an action value of two? If not, and we're going to jump ahead. So I believe this is while, well, I'll see in a moment, but this is while the frog is still jumping up, we're checking if the joystick is still held. And if so, this is how it's got that kind of like analog, not really analog, but you know, variable height jumping. So once you start a jump, then we keep tracking is the joystick still being held? And if it is, okay, and if the joystick is still being held, then we check the frog's Y position and based on the type of jump, high, medium, or low, we compare it with this little table height uh, that I think we, we saw earlier. And we check, has it reached that maximum height for that jump? Otherwise, if it hasn't, then we're continuing upwards and we're keeping track of a timer. Okay, and if we let go of the joystick for a smaller jump, we're also going to go ahead to a head two. So basically there's two ways out. Either if the frog reaches the maximum height of that particular jump, or if the player lets go of the joystick then we're going to go to a head two, which is going to move into the next phase of the jump, which is the arcing down and falling back, back down. But we haven't got there yet. 
Okay, if we finally get through to this point, then that means that we've reached the peak of the jump, either through reaching the maximum height or letting go of the joystick. And we're going to put a 1 in to F1 action, which means our jump is going down now. And we're moving on to that. <laughs> and on we go to that move. And what's going on here? We're checking. Checking again. Oh, and this is, I think, checking for the ground level. Yep. Checking for base. I just, that's the name of the height of the ground. And if we hit it, then we're landing. So the frog's X and Y acceleration go back to zero. The jump is complete. And here we check did we hit a lily pad or did we hit the water? <laughs> so again, we take the frog's X position and then we check it against a series of values to decide, was it on a lily pad or was it on water? If it was on land, then the frog just sort of gets reset and we go back to move. The frog animation's over. But if we land it on water, then we check the direction of the frog. We make sure that he's, his tongue is put away here and put him in swimming mode. That's three into action. And to lower the frog into the water, we add 112. No, so that's not 112 pixels. That's 112 divided by 16 because of this fixed point that we're using. So that's just like, what, about 8 pixels, I guess. And we turn off some sprites. Here's the splash sound. And onto that move. Okay, now here we are continuing the actual, if we've got a jump in progress, where we take the current Y acceleration, and this is basically gravity here. We're checking, did it max out at three? If it is, then we're not going to add any more. That's kind of like terminal velocity is three pixels per frame. But if we're not at terminal velocity, then we're going to add two more fractions. That's uh, like one eighth of a, a pixel per frame. And we're just going to increase the, the Y acceleration. So this is what gives, you know, this says, if I do say so myself, the animation on this is pretty smooth. The, the simple physics. Yeah, it does. It does look smooth. And that's because of the fractional math here. Finally, that long awaited, long referenced move routine. And we very simply take the current frog Y position. We add the, the low bite, add the acceleration and store it back in Y. So very simply, like if, if we were currently at pixel 100 and the Y acceleration is the equivalent of one pixel per frame, then after this is done, we'll have moved from 100 to 101. And this is the, this is the heart of the movement right here. So you just take, take the Y position, add the acceleration, store it back and do the same for the high bite. Same for the X. That's it. Very simple. But now we have to check for our boundaries. So we check the X position and there are invisible walls at the right hand and left hand side of the screen. So we're going to do that here. And if you hit the wall, then we're going to zero out the X acceleration. So you hit the wall and then you just fall straight down. That's what all this does. So that was checking the left edge of the screen. Here's the right edge of the screen. Again, if you hit it, we're going to zero out the X acceleration and set that frog at that right boundary. Okay, now finally 
That's all the movement out of the way. And we're left with the button check. Is the tongue already stuck out? This means it's already underway because tongue is non-zero. Otherwise we have to check, are we able to stick out the frog's tongue? We got to check, is the frog splashing or swimming? If so, no, we can't do this. Jump ahead to display. Are we on autoplay? If so, we have to take care of that separately. And here we're finally going to check, is the joystick button pressed? And I'm just jumping ahead to display, I think, because that's the next major routine. If indeed the tongue has been triggered, then we're going to turn on the tongue sprite and increment the tongue variable. And we'll go ahead to display. But if the tongue was already in progress, then we're checking it. And it can slide. <laughs> it's like a counter. Zero means the tongue is not going on. <laughs> means the tongue isn't in use. So weird talking about this. But if you increment it all the way up to 45, I guess that's how far it sticks out. I don't know if that's actually in pixels or if that's just like the timer. 45... 45 frames. Anyway, that gets displayed later. Well, you know, it's probably that's both out and in again. Kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, it's I think it's just a single counter that handles the tongue sticking back out, out and back in again. I think display will make that more clear. Okay, here we go. Take the frog's X position, turn that into pixels with that convert routine and then store the frog's X position in the hardware sprites. Last time I mentioned that the frogs use two sprites each, a multicolor sprite on the bottom and then a black high res outline. And that's what makes them a higher quality. If carry is set, we have to set the corresponding high bit in the, the ninth bit of the sprite X position, but otherwise we have to clear it. C64 actually has nine bits of horizontal resolution for sprites. And this is something that newcomers to programming 64 have a lot of trouble with that ninth bit, that right edge of the screen. And then we just convert the sprite Y position and also program the, set the frog's position. Distong, <laughs> nice label. So here we're checking the direction of the frog. So this is tongue left. So branch ahead if the tongue is sticking out to the left. If it's not, we take the frog's current position, convert it, and then we do some math here with the current tongue position. And then there's a table, tongue table, <laughs> that we use based on the frog's position we have to calculate the position of its tongue. And we do that based on this index, that counter that goes up to 45, I was just showing you. We add that, I think we'll see that table, but basically it's just added in. So this is just a bunch of kind of math, either to position the tongue to the right of the frog at a variable distance as it sticks out, or down here to the left. So it's just the same kind of positioning code, but for that tongue. It's kind of complicated though, eh? And we're just handling the high bit, the ninth bit of that sprite. Oh, and here we're checking for the action. Are we splashing or swimming? If we're not splashing, again, we take the frog position, divide it by eight. Well, I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. And swimming. Okay. Well, we're just this, this last bit here, we've set the sprite positions. Everything else about the frog has been set, but we haven't set the actual frames of animation. And that's what this is here. 
So we're just checking out what is the frog doing? And this is where it's splashing or swimming. Continue timer. Okay, here's that tongue table. So this is a table that should be 45 bytes long. Let's see. Five. Yeah. Five bytes per row. One, two, three, four. Well, a couple extra. Anyway, pretty close. <laughs> so we got about 45 bytes here. And you can see that the tongue increasingly sticks out. This is the number that we're adding to offset the tongue out to a maximum of 19. And that goes back in again. So which I'm almost proud of myself for using a table for that rather than a whole bunch of extra ridiculous logic. Based on how I code a lot of the other parts of the game, this is actually pretty smart. All right, moving on to this convert routine that we've called so many times. So you call it with the low byte in A and the high in X. Oh, I don't know why this is really inefficient. Why did I put this temporary byte here in the middle that causes a jump to be called every time ahead. Why did I, didn't I just put that down here? I don't know. I guess I need two bytes of workspace. Yeah, so all this does is stores the 12.4 fixed point value, rotates it, shifts it right, rotates it right, so it comes down and becomes a 9-bit value. Count the shift. One, two, three, yeah. Four shifts, four rotates. Hey, here, here's a little simple routine. Clear the screen. Hey, load A with a color. Load X with the character to fill. And again, we're going to block. I haven't been mentioning this, but this block, these blocks of code, all they do is make the labels inside them local. So when I'm using my terrible loop one and so on. I can reuse those in each block of code. So this is just saying background memory and screen memory to a certain color. I'm using this technique. This is a bit ugly, but what it allows you to do is when you have to cover a thousand bytes, or this allows it to be done in four indexed stores in a loop. And this is kind of maximum speed because when we decrement, we can check for it hitting zero and branch up, but we have to offset it by one to make up for the fact that the loop, that the X set register is counting from 250 down to one. And once it reaches zero here, the loop is done. It never does that zeroth right. So to get down to the lowest value, X is going to be 1, so we have to subtract 1 from the actual address where we want the writing to be. It's just a little bit ugly. Like It'd be nicer if it, that was 0 and this was you know, 250 and so on. But there's no way to do that on the 6502 without then having to have an extra comparison here. Decrease X, and then you'd have to go compare X with 255 and that's just a little slower okay moving on here's the scoring routine and we're just storing the score as two bytes and the score is just a four digit each so this is a so this is basically like a binary coded decimal score where you take the score you Shift it four bits to the right and add 48, which is zero, the position of zero in the character set, and then store that on the scoreboard. Load in the high byte of the score again and just keep the low four bits. So you should just watch my episode about scoring for a good explanation of this. Basically, we've got two digits packed into a single byte. And this is just how we extract them. This isn't necessarily the best way, but it's a way. And here's the setup routine. 
This is just when a game starts. This is just setting the frog, the timeouts, the X position, the Y, the acceleration, just saying everything is zero. That's for the left frog. Okay, and frog two, the right hand frog, it's almost identical, different starting position. And you notice here when we're zeroing out everything, we don't, we actually put a one in the direction to make the right hand frog face left. Here's the brain routine. Or check here, if we're in advanced or beginner mode, then we just return because the brain, that is the artificial intelligence, isn't needed. Uh, that's inefficient, but anyway, could just done a single check. If it was like less than two, then we would know to return. Anyway, now we're checking, are we in brain mode two? And if not equal, then we jump ahead to done. So basically this is like where the frog is idle and should the frog jump? What happens is the frog grabs the fly position, fly number one, and does the convert on it. And it checks, is it is the fly's X position either at pixel 120 or 121, or is it over at 220 or 221? Those are two sweet spots on the screen either towards the left or towards the right. And if the fly is just in those, either of those two sweet spots, then we jump. And that's all there is to the AI, really. It's very simple, but pretty effective. Essentially, I found that if the fly was in that, those two positions, there was a good chance that the frog could jump and get that fly. And then... Likewise, we did that for fraud, for fly one. So here we just do the same check as fly two in those positions. And if so, do the jump. Okay, and if we are doing a jump, we switch to level three, which means a jump is in progress. And now the only question is checking the fly Y position and comparing it to the frog Y position looks here like if we're within five pixels plus or minus of a fly, then stick out the tongue. And again, check for the second fly. So that's all there is to the AI. It's actually pretty simple. It could be simplified further and probably improved more, but it is pretty effective. When you combine physics with very simple decision making, you can get some surprisingly lifelike behaviors. Okay, here's the code for the title screen. This is whenever you enter the title screen, this is executed. The music is initialized, both the SID music and the digital drums. We expand the border. I still don't know why we shrunk the border in the gameplay, but anyway. Okay, and here's where we copy a whole bunch of data. This is just copying the title screen image onto the screen, like that big frog and the text. And this is the convoluted loop to copy the current level, beginner or advanced, for each of the frogs. That's all that does. For both player one, here's player two. And once all that copying's done, then we turn on the screen. That's often a bit of polish on C64 games. If you're going to do a copy that's going to take more than a full frame, disable the screen, do the copy, then turn on the screen. It just looks more polished, more so, rather than seeing a bit of garbage on the screen. So the colors, let's just say a bunch of Vic registers and a raster IRQ. And here's the joystick reading code when it's pushing left and right to choose between advanced or beginner uh, is all this does. <laughs> Terrible. It should not take three screens of code. And checking for the joystick buttons. 
Oh, and this is checking for the keyboard, I believe for the Q button to quit out of the game. And if so, this is that exit routine. I mentioned in the first episode that the Lodestar guys wanted me to make it so the game cleanly exited back to the Lodestar menu on disk when you hit Q. And uh, this was all the code that was required. It was a bit of, kind of tricky to figure out to clean up after oneself. Often when we're coding the 64, we completely take over the machine for it to do our bidding, but getting it back to a state where basic and kernel are in, zero page is properly initialized, so that again, so that another program can load cleanly. We're so used to just resetting the computer, but anyway, Lodestar always had it so it returned cleanly. So that's just a bunch of cleanup here. Oh, here, yeah, here's a whole bunch of cleanup. We copy back. Those are the various basic vectors. Restoring them, turning off the SID, resetting a bunch of VIC registers, clearing the screen, and getting out of there. This is the raster and trip that just plays the music and the digital drums on the title screen. Oh, and here's the text, beginner or advanced. I don't know why I didn't store this a better way, but anyway, this spells B, we have the screen codes. I guess for this game, I put the character set way down at the bottom where zero is probably a blank and one is A for advanced, D, four is D and so on. And see how that spells out beginner and advanced, just with a simple A equals one, B equals two, and so on. And here's the timer routine. This keeps track, you know how the sky goes dark as you play the game. Well, we're just keeping track of this timer, counting down every frame, and then we compare it with this table of time, and I think there's four numbers in there, and each one, when we got the blue sky at the beginning, and then the sky goes a bit darker, into the grays, and eventually into the black. That's what this keeps track of here. And yeah, it's loading it from this table and storing in the background color. And if the timer gets down to zero, it actually waits for you to press a key and then exits back out to the tile screen. And here's the different time values as the timer counts down. Well, here's again with the double nibbles. I don't know why I did that. But yeah, these are the different time periods. Multiply those by 100 hex. And that's the number of frames for each of those stages that they trigger at. Okay, setting up the flies. Very simple here. Just uh, setting everything to zero. Fly setup one, fly setup two. And this little routine to look up the get sound effects. Okay, and here we're into the copy and paste territory where fly two, last episode we had looked at the fly logic already. And terribly, I just copied and pasted it here. And this is like the worst thing about this. I nearly doubled the length of this game because of just because of this part and really had to copy and paste it. Not only is it inefficient, but also once I copied the second fly, if I want to make a change to the behavior of the flies, I'd actually have to do it in two spots. Terrible. Yeah, so there's all that. IRQ3, uh, I don't even know what that raster interrupt does. Oh, this is probably the one that splits the score at the top, which is in text mode from the bitmap background, like the pond and so on. And this was me attempting to time it all out because I think I was getting some flickers there. Yeah, it turns on the bitmap mode, so on. Hey, and here's the frog two. We're not going to look at that, but again, 
terrible copy and paste it goes on and on and it's almost exactly the same except just those minor differences like the color of the frog and oh but i did know something funny here we'll find this for the brain so much code here oh yeah here brain two okay so frog two look at this the other one had when the frog is checking for the position of the fly frog one only has four x positions i think they're the same like 100 101 242 41 but look at this the second frog cheats it has one extra case where it'll jump. Well, I don't know if that's cheating. I don't know if that's an advantage or a disadvantage, but basically there are five fly positions for both fly that will trigger a jump. So that second frog will, will probably jump more often. And I don't know if that results in overall a better score or not. Not sure why I did that, if that was a mistake or that was deliberate to just introduce uh, just another factor. Okay, and there, finally, we're done. Whew, that was rough to get through. So feel free to give me some honest feedback about this. I don't know if this is detailed enough. This is This could be simultaneously uh, not detailed enough to learn anything, but on the flip side, uh, overly detailed to be entertaining. So I don't know. That is a walkthrough, but if you have questions about how something in particular works, maybe I could do a third episode and go deeper into a small piece of code or modify this, or maybe I should just get on with something else. Get back to that book club. As always, thank you very much to each of you for your support. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Shut